In part 5 of lecture 1, we will talk about the four paradigms of programming languages, as well as compiling versus interpreting the program. Programming languages are most commonly broken down into four different paradigms. Imperative languages, which tell the computer how to perform a task. Functional languages, which write algorithms as function definitions. Declarative language, which specifies a set of declarations and object-oriented languages which allow for the creation and the use of classes of objects. Imperative languages give a series of commands to the computer, telling it what to do in gory detail. It is based on the concept of a machine state, that we know the values stored in all memory locations that are relevant to the program. Imperative languages allow for some structure, including if-then-else constructions, loops, and even subprogram calls. Most of the more popular non-object-oriented languages are imperative, including Fortran, COBOL, C, and so on. Functional programming languages look at the program as a set of functions that produce one result or another. The key question that functional programs ask is, given the data and given the function, what will it produce? And as we would expect, each statement looks exactly like a function call. Lisp, Scheme, and ML are examples of functional languages. To get a good idea of the difference, let's look at a program or a function in Scheme to find the greatest common divisor of two numbers. If the second parameter, V, is 0, our answer is the first parameter, U. Otherwise, the answer is the greatest common divisor of V and u mod v. It's pretty clear that this is recursive, and it's equally clear that this is very close to the formal mathematical definition for greatest common divisor. This rigor is what makes functional programming popular with those who prefer it. We can do the same thing in C++. Arguably, it might seem more readable to those more used to imperative programming than functional programming and it can be converted to an iterative algorithm if one wished to do so. Declarative languages are rule-based, and they perform checking to determine if a particular condition is true, and if and when a condition is true, it carries out the appropriate actions. Most declarative languages, such as Prolog, are written in terms of predicate calculus, where a predicate is a property of a data item or the relationship between two or more data items. These lead to a structure where a particular condition leads to a particular action. There are two clauses in this version of greatest common divisor, written in Prolog. It tells us that the greatest common divisor of u and v is u, if v is 0. Also, it says that the greatest common divisor of u and v is x, if v is not equal to 0, if y equals u mod v, and if the greatest common divisor of v and y is x. Object-oriented languages effectively allow the programmer to define his or her own data type and use it as you would any other data type in the language. The central concept is data abstraction, that we can separate the idea of how we envision data from the details of how we implement it. Imagine that you are trying to write a space travel game. As you maneuver the spaceship as it travels over a planet's surface, there are many things that you need to handle. The altitude of the ship, its attitude, its orientation in space, its velocity, its position over the planet. But you don't want to have to think about which pixels you need to turn on and off. At least not then. We want to be able to separate out the different levels of abstraction at different points of time. There are three principles that we use to implement data abstraction. Encapsulation allows us to close off private data and methods, so only certain parts of the code can use them. Polymorphism allows us to write different functions and operators and give them the same name. This allows different implementations of the same operation to share a name, even though they are doing this with data of different types. Think about writing a method to perform square roots that needs to evaluate them for integers, floating point, and complex numbers. Inheritance allows us 
to create new classes out of existing ones. For example, if we create a class called Motor Vehicle, we can create a class that is derived from it called Car that has most, if not all, of their properties and methods, but has additional properties and methods and even its own variations on other properties and methods that it has in common with the base class. You see an example of this here in Java, where the class contains several methods that allow us to use the greatest common divisor program. If you really want to see the advantages of working in an object-oriented language, you need to look at larger and more complex programs. As in any engineering field, in computer science, you frequently find that you have to find the best mixture of criteria that are in direct conflict with each other. To achieve better reliability, you may need to increase the cost of a program. In APL, and in a few other languages, writability and expressivity may conflict with readability. This is especially true in APL, where you can write a program to do a complex calculation in 15 minutes late one afternoon, but not be able to understand what you wrote the following morning. Features that may make a programming language more flexible may also create safety problems. There are basically two ways to translate a program all at once while saving the translation, or only a bit at a time when you need it but without saving anything. There is also a hybrid approach where you do some preliminary processing to save a more machine-readable version of the program, but then only translate what you need when you need it. What you see here is compiling, where we translate the entire program. What gets saved is a translation of the program that may not be entirely complete because it may not include declarations for certain variables or certain procedures that appear in another file that comprise another part of the program. The linker resolves these missing references and creates one large file with the entire executable version of the program with all the necessary references resolved. A good analogy is when they compose the front page of the New York Times, where most articles are continued inside, and when they compose the front page, they don't know exactly where inside these articles will be continued. After the inner pages are completed, they may go back and add the actual page number where the articles are continued. The missing page numbers for the articles inside are like the unresolved references in a program before linking. The complete front page with the page numbers of the continued articles is similar to the program after linking is completed. Interpreting is different. The interpreter reads the program as its data and executes the instructions as it encounters them, transferring control to other parts of the program when instructed to do so. It can accept data from various sources, as all programs do, and produce outputs like other programs but no executable version of the program is saved. The hybrid process has the interpreter do an initial translation, saving the program in an intermediate version that can be read more quickly than the original source code. From then on, it uses this and uses a purely interpreted process for the remainder of the program run.